Good morning. Wonderful to see you all. My name is Wayne, and I'm part of the leadership here at Cornerstone. And it honestly is a privilege to be ministering the word to you this morning. I don't take it lightly. It's something I take very seriously, the word of God. And uh, this morning, I trust the message will encourage you. I trust Holy Spirit will speak to you and take these simple words and actually cement them in our hearts. And um, I'm going to start off by reading a scripture out of John 1, right at the beginning of John. And uh, you might think that's a little bit odd, us being uh, towards the end of Jesus' life on earth here. But uh, John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. The Son of God came down on earth. And this morning, we're going to look and unpack the events following, uh, leading up to Jesus' death. And uh, I just trust that you will hear God, this message of love that, uh, that Greg just brought. God loves you. He died for each and every single one of us in this room. And that in itself is an extremely <laughs> extravagant gift that he's given each one of us. If that's nothing else, if all you take from today is that God loves you, I trust that that'll be something that'll just bear fruit in your life. The next scripture I want to read is out of John 18. And John 18, verse 37 to 38, it says, Then Pilate said to him, So you're a king. Bit of a mocking statement. You don't look like a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? What is truth is still being asked today. And this morning, the question that's going to be asked of you is, what is truth? And to be honest, I struggled to give a title to my message. All through the week, I was thinking, God, what, what is it that you want to say? And the message I felt to be titled, Confronted by Truth. And confronted is a strange word, right? Confronted in, in, ensues, it means sort of like a battle, like a fight that's about to happen. And the reality is, Truth is under attack. There is a fight for truth. And Jesus being truth, there was a fight aimed at him. The enemy was intent on destroying truth. And this morning we're going to unpack some of the interactions that Jesus had with, uh, with certain individuals within the space of 24 hours of him dying. Each one of these people being confronted by the truth. And we're going to have a look at their response and see how they respond to him and how they respond to the truth. In the last passage there in John 18 where it says, After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. The truth was, Jesus was not guilty of anything. The reality is he paid the price for somebody else's guilt, not his own. And that is the incredible message about today. Jesus represented the, the sacrificial lamb from the Passover. Back in the days when Egypt, when the Israelites fell themselves in Egypt, they had to take a spotless lamb and uh, use the blood and wipe it on, on the, the posts and the, the doorposts and, and the lintel of their dwellings. 
And when judgment came, when the angel of death came over, it passed over their house if it saw the blood of the lamb. And fast forward through to today, we see Jesus being a representation of that lamb. Him dying that sacrificial death. And I remember the first time I was confronted by the image of Jesus hanging on a cross. I was in about standard four. We were watching a movie about Jesus' death. And seeing this man battered and bruised up on a cross, it confronted me. Why would this man die in such a way? At that point in time, I had tears running down my eyes. One of my friends said to me, are you crying? And like any good standard four, grade six boy, I said, no, you're crying. (laughs) I had heard the message. I had heard and read about Jesus' death. But all of a sudden, visually, I saw Jesus hanging on the cross, beaten, bruised. And it confronted me. Something in my heart in that moment changed. Why would this man do such a thing? Why? The word of God is an extremely powerful gift that God has also given us. He's given his son, he's given us his word. The word of God, it is full of truth. And if you've read the Bible from cover to cover, you will see that there's a thread a redemptive thread from the start to the finish. And that's the reality, that's the truth. God was always intent on saving us, restoring us into right relationship with him. And this week I was listening to a a podcast, a secular podcast, and the guy made a statement. He says, I've I've decided this year to, to read the Bible, and I started at the beginning of January, and I wanted to read the Bible. And he found himself on a plane pretty, uh, in, in a pretty bad funk, and he, he, he wasn't feeling great at all. And he eventually thought, you know what, let me just pull out the Bible and carry on reading the Bible. And he said, after about 30, 40 minutes of reading the Bible, he actually felt better. And he was like, I want to dismiss this as like, just, I'm just feeling better but now. But he said, but there's actually something that's happened here. I was feeling one way, and all of a sudden, reading this book, I'm feeling another way. And here's a secular individual saying, there's something different about this book. And this morning, you could possibly dismiss the story of Jesus as a fairy tale. Ah, It's history. Who knows? But there's an element of faith that you're going to have to take on and say, do I believe that this is the Word of God? Is this truth? Or is it just another story? And my, my faith is that this morning you'll walk away with this thing of this is truth. So this week leading up to Jesus' death, we see him coming into the city, a triumphal entry. People are praising him. We see the following day here some righteous anger clears out the temple. washes his disciples' feet, and has a meal with him. And we're going to pick up from where Jesus is having a meal with his disciples. Matthew 26, verses 20 to 25. And when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Talk about a downer, right? Having a nice meal, (laughs) chatting, discussing, and all of a sudden Jesus comes up with a statement, one of you are going to betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after the other, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not, had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. 
My first point, and I've tried to keep it peas so that everybody will remember, right? Alliteration helps people remember. The first P is the pretender. Judas is a pretender. He's pretending to be a disciple. He refers to Jesus not as Lord, but as rabbi, teacher. We see Judas being called by Jesus as like the other disciples. He calls. He says, do you want to follow me? And Judas says, yes, I'll follow you. And like many other people during that time, probably thought and saw Jesus and understood possibly this guy is the Messiah, but he's actually going to bring political upheaval. He's going to kick out the Romans, and all of a sudden we as Israelites are going to take our place again, and things are going to be restored. So when they heard Jesus speak, and when they heard him communicate these things, they thought, this is what he's going to do. And Judas was no exception. Except Judas' motives were not necessarily as pure. He thought, you know what? I can get in here on the ground floor. If I get close to this guy, when he overthrows the kingdom and when we are restored to our rightful place, I will be close to this man. And we see him taking that attitude right the way through. Judas was also in charge of the money. And we learn that Judas was pocketing from the till, stealing money. Now, the audacity of this man to be stealing in front of Jesus, right? Jesus speaking about, do not sin no more, forgiveness of sin. But here is Judas continually sinning, stealing and pocketing the money. He was witness and privy to everything that Jesus had done. He was there. He saw it with his own eyes, Jesus healing, but yet he refused to call him Lord and he still called him Rabbi. There is no reference where Judas calls Jesus Lord. It is always Rabbi, meaning teacher. He was pretending to be something he wasn't. He was playing the part of the disciple. But actually, his heart was growing further and further away from Jesus. Sin had infiltrated his life and started to corrupt him. But even at this late stage, Jesus is giving Judas a way out. He warns him. He says it would be better for the man to not even be been born if he betrays me. Jesus, in his grace, is giving Judas a way out. He hasn't ratted him out to the rest of the disciples. He didn't say, you see that guy sitting in the corner, it's him. He didn't. He gave him an option. He says to him, I know what you've done. I know what you're going to do, but there's still a way out. He extends grace to Judas. This is the man who's going to betray him. And scripture doesn't pull any punches. It goes on to say that Satan entered Judas. The rift in his heart, sin, had gotten so big that it allowed Satan to come into his life. And instead of being used as an instrument of blessing, he was now used as an instrument of destruction. He would go on to betray Jesus. At the dead of night where nobody was witnessing, when the crowds couldn't be riled up and possibly uh, let Jesus escape. Matthew 27, verse 3 to 5. It says, when Judas, his betrayer, saw Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back 30 pieces of silver, the 30 pieces that was given to him to betray Jesus to the chief priests and to the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. All of a sudden, his eyes were opened to the fact that Jesus was actually innocent. All these accusations, he could see it. This man was innocent. All of a sudden, he felt guilty, remorse. Oops, what have I done? 
And they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. And he went and he hung himself. He felt bad. There was remorse. But there was no repentance. This is the scandalous truth about a rugged cross where our Savior Jesus died. The same mercy and grace that he extends to each and every single one of us, he would have extended it to Judas. He said that was on offer for you, Judas. But instead of coming to repentance, a change of heart, a change of attitude, a change of action, he was simply remorseful. He felt bad for what he had done. And Judas serves as a warning. We can play the game. We can say and do all the right things. You can even be physically close to Jesus in a sense, but actually be very far away in your heart. We can allow sin to take a hold of our lives and lead us in a very, very different direction. The crazy thing is, the one who could forgive his sins was staring him right in the face before he kissed him. Jesus, staring him right in the face. Judas serves as a warning for us. There is death, there is destruction, but there is also life. And the choice is honestly ours. Choose life or choose death. Judas, confronted by the truth, chose death. The second point is the proud. And this refers to Peter. Now, I admire Peter. I think Peter is one of the coolest disciples, right? And uh, Peter reminds, us, reminds me of a, a friend of ours. The one time we went to, uh, we were down in the, in the coast, and there was a, a bridge, um, well, a, a cliff you could jump off. And a bunch of us literally came to the edge of this thing, looking over, kind of thinking, are we brave enough to do this thing? And one of our friends, was a, was a young lady, she just came running past us and jumped off. And we were like, Oh, flip, now we have to do it. <laughs> there is no option, right? And this is Peter. Peter just kind of does it. He doesn't even think. He just runs and he jumps. Hey, there's waves crashing around us, lightning, thunder. Jesus is calling. He's walking on the water. Of course I can do it. Let me climb out the boat. And off he goes. That's Peter. And there's something I admire about Peter. For me, I think I'm too cerebral in a sense. I think things do too much. Here is Peter, gung-ho, let me go after it. But there's something that Peter needs to learn. And in Luke 22, verse 31 to 34, Jesus foretells of Peter's denial. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to both prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. Pretty awkward, right? Again, Jesus having dinner with his disciples. Awkward moment. Of course, Jesus, I'm going to follow you till the end. But Jesus warns Peter and he says, Satan's demanded to sift you. He wants to take you out and he's going to do everything in his power to take you out. But here's the cool thing. Jesus is saying, I, me, Jesus, is, am praying for you that your faith will not be destroyed in that moment. That your faith will not stumble. He doesn't pray that you might not find temptation, that you, that you might not be sifted in a sense. You're going to go through these things. 
He doesn't pray that you don't go through these things, but he actually says, he prays that you will remain strong when you face these things. And he paints a hard truth for Peter. He says, you're not as strong as you think. You might think you have all the gusto and all the bravado, but actually you're not as strong as you think. There's an element of pride in your life. And the enemy wants to take you out. And if you're not careful, pride will be your downfall. So after the meal, we see Jesus going with his disciples, three of them, Peter, James, and John. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they pray. And Greg alluded to it earlier with regards to Jesus, now praying in the garden, making these statements, fully human, fully feeling the weight and the gravity of the situation that faces him, in his humanness saying, if there is an opportunity or if there's a way that this thing can be done without me having to go through what I know I have to go through, can that be the case, Lord? Hey, doesn't that sound very human? Man, this is difficult. Can I, do, do I really need to do that? We see Jesus facing that. But he brings his disciples, these three along with him. And he says to them, he gives them instructions. He says, I'm going to go over there and pray. I want you to carry on praying here. And in Mark 14, verse 37 to 38, and he came back and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a couple of things out of here. Jesus, in his lovingness and his care and his consideration for Peter, warns Peter. He says to Peter, something is coming along and you need to pray in order to prepare yourself. There needs to be a preparation of your heart. And how you're going to do that is through prayer. And so often we diminish the responsibility, we diminish the power of prayer in our lives and we relegate it to a shopping list. But actually, God says to you, there is a preparation in your heart that takes place when you commit to praying and you commit to talking to you and you commit to interceding with me. There is something that happens that bolsters, bolsters our heart, that allows us to face difficulties, that allows us to face hardships. And he's calling his disciples to pray. And I can relate to their weakness, to be honest. Late at night, you're trying to pray, keeping one eye open. They've just eaten a big meal, right? Mark is full, Ugh is too. My Afrikaans is not great, I understand that. But there is something of this. There's a weakness in his flesh. And despite his best efforts, they cannot keep their eyes awake. And three times, Jesus comes to them. Why are you sleeping? Come on. And eventually... He says it's too late. And in Mark 14, verse 46 to 50, he says, And they laid hands on him and seized him, being Jesus. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled and they all left him and fled. So all of a sudden, these brave disciples who said, we will stick with you to the end, the initial reaction is to draw the sword, cut, let's fight, let's fight. But when they see Jesus' reaction of not fighting, again, their paradigm, their view of what should have happened actually didn't happen. And all of a sudden now, doubt and fear start to creep in their hearts. And Peter wasn't exempt from that. All of a sudden, he thought he was brave. He could fight this thing. He takes out his sword, cuts the guy's ears off, and Jesus says, no, no, that's not the way. And then all of a sudden, now Peter's left like, well, what is the way then? Are we just to, like, let this happen? How can you give up like this, Jesus? Come on, let's fight. And in this state of possibly bewilderment, confusion, we see them fleeing. We see them running away from Jesus, leaving him to face his accusers alone. All of a sudden, Peter's world comes crashing down. 
We see Peter watching from a distance. In Luke 22, verse 50, 56 to 62. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little, little, a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly, this man also was with him, for he too is Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And he had said to him, and Peter remembered the Lord saying to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Could you imagine Jesus looking at you? In that moment, you've just done the very thing you said you would never do. That, mm, in the pit of your stomach, what have I done? Probably scratching his head thinking, goodness gracious, what have I done? I can't believe I've done this. Did I actually do what I think? Maybe I'm going to wake up. This is going to be a horrible dream. But actually we see him doing it. Things are not looking great. Jesus has been deserted, been betrayed. Now he's all by himself. Team disciples are not doing very well, are they? They've kicked a few own goals. We see Jesus now being taken, pushed from pillar to post, beaten, crown of thorns placed on his head, mocked, ridiculed, accused of things that he hadn't done, spat on, mocked, till finally we're seeing him up on a cross between two sinners. And in Luke 23, we see the picture being painted. It says, in verse 32, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide and they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, for he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And my third P is the pair of pilferers. I did have to use a thesaurus for that one. (laughs) Jesus finds himself between two thieves, being mocked, being ridiculed, passes by, looking up, laughing at him, scoffing at him. The one criminal basically saying to him, come on, if you say who you are, get us out of here. I don't really like hanging up on on this cross here. Get us out of here. What can you do for me? How can you get me out of this situation? Come on, do it. Show us who you are. What was Jesus' response to that? Silence. Now, on the other hand, the other criminal who's possibly maybe paying a little bit more attention to what Jesus is saying and maybe seeing Jesus praying out loud and forgiving those at the foot of his cross who are now gambling over his garments. And he says to them, forgive them, Father, for they know what they, not they do. Surely that's not the demeanor and the attitude of somebody who's hanging on the cross being beaten for the last 
24 hours, who's been mocked, ridiculed, how can he say forgive them? Surely you want revenge. Surely you want justice. Surely you want something to be done about this. How can you simply say forgive them? His response is slightly, Jesus, uh, slightly different to Jesus. But the other rebuked the other criminal and saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. He understands that he's up there for a reason. He's actually guilty of what he's been condemned for. The punishment he's getting is what he is deserving. He understands that. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise being heaven. The one criminal is met with silence. This criminal is met with eternal life. The beauty about this story is that this criminal didn't have a chance to go through DNA, didn't have a chance to attend a Bible study, didn't have a chance to be baptized, didn't even have a chance to undo the wrongs that he did, maybe apologize to the people he stole from or something. He didn't have a chance to do any of that. He simply paid the price for what he was doing in that moment. But yet redemption was at hand. Salvation was at hand. The same salvation that was at hand towards Judas. Instead, this man identified it and he took it. And he says, yes, please, I will have that. I know I don't deserve it. I know I can't, in, in all the real sense, have it. But because you, the truth, are offering it to me, I will take it. And his reward is everlasting life. His reward is in eternity in the presence of his Savior, of his Lord, of his King, of the God Almighty. In stark contrast to that of Judas. A man who was with Jesus for mere moments versus that of a man who was with Jesus for three years. The contrast couldn't be more stark if you tried. But yet, the gift of salvation was available to both. We see in Matthew 27, shortly after this, Jesus crying out. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, God is turning his back on his son. He can no longer look at his son, Jesus. Why? Because he has become sin. God cannot look upon that. And he forsakes his son. And in that moment, there's an incredible moment. Why is it an incredible moment? Because what that means for you and me is that God will never turn his back on us. If we choose to confess our faith in his son, Jesus Christ, when God looks upon us, he will not have to turn his back on us because he will see his son, Jesus. John 19, verse 30, it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed and he gave up his spirit, bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In that moment, the victory was done. What Satan, the enemy, had been intending for evil, for harm, for destruction, in that moment, it is finished. In Luke 23, verse 44 to 47, it says, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, where the sun his light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. All of a sudden we see the earth responding. It speaks about an earthquake, darkness coming over the whole earth. 
The universe is responding to what's happened. We see the curtain, the curtain being torn in the temple. What that means is now all of a sudden there is access to the Holy of Holies. We don't need an intermediary. We can go to God ourselves. We can commune with God ourselves. All of a sudden we can come into his presence without the fear of being cast down and struck down because of our sin and our guilt and our shame. We can actually be in his presence. We see now our Savior is dead. But the good news is on Sunday, he is risen. So not only do we serve a Savior who is willing to give his own life, but actually we serve a risen Savior. And we see the tomb being empty. We sung that wonderful uh, uh, song this morning about the empty tomb. The reality, there is an empty tomb. We're not serving some dead individual who's sitting in a tomb rotting away. We're actually serving our risen Lord, Jesus. And we see Jesus appearing to his disciples during the course of the next 40 days. He appears to them three times. And I'm gonna end with this. You might be thinking, what about Peter? Peter was left in a pretty bad place, right? That's my clock. I'm running out of time. (laughs) Five more minutes. What about Peter? All of a sudden we see Peter running off, disillusioned, what have I done? And in John 21, the third time that Jesus meets his disciples, we see the disciples going back to what they used to. Peter says, let's go fishing, right? That's what he knew. He thought his ministry days are over. Let me go back to something that I actually know. Maybe I'm comfortable with. And we see him fishing. We see the disciples fishing, but they don't catch anything. And then all of a sudden, they spot, John spots Jesus from the side. And he says, isn't that Jesus? Jesus calls out to them and he says, throw your nets on the other side. A miracle happens. All of a sudden, there's a massive catch. Tons and tons of fish. Cool little thing about that. What happens when God speaks when Jesus speaks into our situation, our circumstances, our secular life, and we listen to his voice in that opportune moment, something can change. That's a side point. But we see Peter, again, still gung-ho, puts on his clothes, jumps off the side of the boat, swims to the shore, and comes to Jesus. Now, they still haven't addressed the uncomfortable notion of, of him having denied him three times it must be that like uncomfortable elephant in the room right you're kind of like hey oh okay and uh, you know that thing I said kind of uh, and all of a sudden but in this moment Jesus decides to address it and he says to Peter do you love me more than these and Peter says of course I do and he reinstates Peter he asks him three times do you love me Every time that Peter denied him, the three times, he asks Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter responds with an emphatic yes. He reinstates him. He picks him up. He says, it's okay, Peter. We stumble. We fall. But I'm here to pick you up each time if you will simply confess your love for me. And here's Peter being reinstated. Not only coming to the Savior and saying, you can save me, but actually reinstating him, recommissioning him, saying, Peter, I've got got something for you to do. Not just simply to come and save you, but actually you've got work to do, Peter. To take this message, this gospel, this incredible good news to the world, to nations, to peoples. I want you to do this, Peter. I am reinstating you. And we see Peter, we we read about Peter's ministry. We see what the disciples do through that. An incredible thing. But Peter, again, in his humanness, he asks a question about John. It's like, what about John? And Jesus' response to him, he says, Peter, you follow me. And so often we can get consumed by comparison in terms of but my ministry should look like this or my walk should look like this. 
God says to us, Jesus says to each one of us, he says, you follow me. We each get to walk this incredible journey for ourselves. He has called each and every one of us by name. And he goes on to say, when he, just before he's, he's taken up into the heavens, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will give you a helper, being the Holy Spirit, who will empower you, will give you boldness beyond your wildest dreams, who will be there in moments to comfort, to guide. And that is his gift to us. Not only salvation, but actually something more than that. A life that is full and abundant. Let me end with this. I think there's elements of each of these people that I've mentioned in each and every single one of us. If we were honest and made an honest assessment about ourselves, possibly there have been times where we've been pretending to walk this walk. There's elements of us pretending. There's elements of us possibly being proud, thinking we're more important or stronger than we potentially are. At some point in time, we were possibly the sinner with no idea of a savior. And then all of a sudden we heard this glimpse. But the thing I want us to take away is it's not our love for Jesus. It's not our love for God. But it's his love for us that is the key to all of this. His redeeming love. Our love fails, but his love never fails. That's it. <laughs> Could I ask you to stand? I'm going to pray for all of us. It's not that my prayer is anything special. But actually I do have a faith just in my heart for what God possibly wants to do this morning. And so, no matter where you are, this is the beauty about the kingdom that we're a part of. We don't need intermediaries to go to God. We can go to Him ourselves. We can open our hearts and our mouths to Him.